When you look back in history at royal romances, surprising as it may seem, few have happy ever after endings, and in many instances, the idea of love and marriage being inextricably linked is not quite as common as you might at first think. In fairy stories, handsome kings and princes regularly sweep fair maidens off their feet, transforming them into princesses and queens. And although a rarer occurrence, a royal princess can create a prince out of the most unpromising of characters. But in real life, as most of us know, the course of true love never runs smoothly, and in the case of so many highly publicised royal romances, past and present, the pursuit of love can be even more hazardous. The main reason for this is the significance of the royal romance when it comes to the line of succession, as every royal dynasty down through the ages has relied upon a healthy supply of legitimate heirs to consolidate its right to rule. The pressure this has put upon monarchs and monarchs in waiting to marry the most suitable princes or princesses isn't always a recipe for wedded bliss. Although there have been occasions when prospective brides and grooms met each other for the first time on the way to the royal chapel, and went on to enjoy a long, happy, fulfilling, fruitful and faithful alliance. Now should you be thinking that this all sounds very contrived and calculating, as images of the chivalrous King Arthur in full knightly attire astride a galloping white charger in search of Queen Guinevere spring to mind, you do sometimes have to delve a little deeper. And when it comes to romance, things aren't always as straightforward as history might at first glance suggest. Travelling around Great Britain, there are any number of locations that claim to be connected with the legendary king. From the mountains and valleys of Wales, over the mystical Bodmin Moor to the wild Cornish coast at Tintagel and Land's End. But if you're looking for Camelot, King Arthur's legendary court where he presided over his magnificent round table, your journey could well bring you to this Roman fort at Caerleon in Gwent on one day and take you to the Great Hall at Winchester the next. And to confuse matters still further, the graves of Arthur and Guinevere can be found amongst the ruins at Glastonbury Abbey, or so the legend goes. The story of Arthur and Guinevere is still the foundation for many books and films, with each new generation that discovers this all-time great romance telling their own version of royal love and loss. Upon realising that King Arthur's most influential advisor was a magician called Merlin, it's evident that this is perhaps not the most fact-based of romances. But when the successful older king spotted the beautiful young Guinevere, he asked Merlin to make all the arrangements for a royal marriage. Merlin was reluctant to do so, as he could see into the future and believed any union between the pair was doomed. Even so, when 
pressed by the love-struck Arthur further against his better judgment, Merlin arranged the marriage, which was celebrated the length and breadth of the land. And one wedding gift was so well received, it's actually gone down in history, namely a certain round table given by the father of the bride, where Arthur's knights would all be given their place. All was well, until one of these knights, Sir Lancelot, fell in love with the Queen, who was quite literally swept off her feet by this knight in shining armour. Merlin's words of warning proved to be well-founded, and King Arthur's Camelot was shattered. Arthur was killed in battle by one of his other knights, Sir Mordred, and legend has it that he sleeps beneath Cadbury Castle in Somerset, ready to return to save the nation if it's ever in danger again. In fact, whatever their differences in life, it's said that all of Arthur's knights are also sleeping here in case their services are ever needed. Interestingly, this hill is just a short distance from Glastonbury, making the graves amongst the abbey ruins rather redundant, nothing more than a good story promoted by the monks to bring them pilgrims and prosperity. Placing all this historically is rather tricky, as any evidence of a King Arthur belongs to the 5th century AD, just after the Romans left Britain. But the popular image we all have of Arthur and his Queen is far more in keeping with the 12th century. This is because a Welsh bishop known as Geoffrey of Monmouth, in honour of the lovely border town where he originated, wrote the History of the Kings of Britain during the early 1100s, and where factual evidence was missing, he allowed his imagination to recreate the story. This just goes to show how careful we need to be with history, and when it comes to romance, there are many royal tales told that have been subject to fanciful interpretation over the years. So, after the classic love story of Arthur and Guinevere, we'll move on to a more accurately recorded era, well, at least for the times and places of births, marriages and deaths, if not for the more secret matters of the heart. While Geoffrey of Monmouth was busy writing about the kings of Britain's past in the 12th century, the royal family of his time were equally as fascinating as any of the stories he had to tell. For most people, Richard I, the Lionheart, is the best-known king of this particular century. With his connections to the Robin Hood story, there's a great deal of romance surrounding him, but his own marriage to Berengaria of Navarre was far from successful, in part due to his constant absences away on the Crusades. It's been suggested, though, that this was not the reason for the lack of offspring as some think that it was his wife's brother Sancho who was the real object of his affection and the royal marriage was never actually consummated. It's therefore fair to say that Richard I is perhaps not the best of kings to feature in this programme, despite early indications to the contrary, and it is in fact Richard's father, Henry II, who's more to offer the true romantic in search of a king who knew how to woo the ladies. Even as a young man, Henry of Anjou was a handsome hero and a force to be reckoned with. His mother, Matilda, had been promised to the throne of England after the death of her father, Henry I, who made the Baron's promise to accept her as his heir. When he died, they reneged on the deal and the crown passed to his nephew Stephen. This resulted in years of civil war, 
that was only resolved when young Henry raised an army and King Stephen agreed to name Matilda's son as his heir. Stephen died in 1154, and when Henry was crowned king at Westminster Abbey, the handsome French-born 21-year-old brought with him a queen, his French wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. It was an interesting match, with the bride being about 11 years older than the groom and she'd previously been married to the French sovereign Louis VII. Eleanor claimed she had thought to marry a king only to find she'd married a monk, and the charismatic, passionate, well-educated woman, who'd also been the most eligible heiress in all of France, sought an annulment from the Pope, which was granted on the grounds of consanguinity, that basically means they were too closely related. Ironically, she was even more closely related to Henry, her second husband, and if rumours are to be believed, she had an affair with his father before him, which resulted in Geoffrey of Anjou advising his son against marrying his chosen bride. It's possible that the chemistry between Eleanor and Henry was electric in the early days, but overall the marriage was as stormy as both of their personalities. That Henry was unfaithful to his queen is undisputed, and his choice of mistress was varied to say the least. The mother of his illegitimate son, Geoffrey, who went on to become Archbishop of York, was described by a medieval writer at Henry II's court as being a base-born common harlot who stooped to all uncleanliness. Henry also fathered illegitimate children with Alice of France, the daughter of Eleanor's former husband, Louis VII, and his second wife, Constance of Castile. And if that wasn't complicated enough, Henry was actually supposed to look after her, as she was betrothed to his son, Richard the Lionheart, of Robin Hood fame mentioned earlier. Over a period of 13 years, Eleanor provided Henry with five sons and three daughters. But by the time the last child, John, was born, the marriage was in effect over. Again, this hardly sounds like a first-rate romance, but one of the major factors in the deterioration of Eleanor and Henry's marriage was a lady who we know very little about, generally referred to as the Fair Rosamond, who the king was quite openly head over heels in love with. To discover more, we need to travel to the beautiful Gloucestershire countryside where England meets Wales. Their border regions, known as the Welsh Marches, were controlled by the Marcher Lords, often of Norman descent, with strong ties to the English kings, and Henry II met his fair Rosamond while visiting her father, a Marcher Lord. This wonderful manor house, a former Cistercian Abbey in the Forest of Dean, was built on land granted by Henry II, and while records exist of later monarchs staying at the abbey while hunting in the royal forest, there's been speculation that Henry and Rosamond might have met in secret here when the king was in the district. Nevertheless, this royal love story is most frequently associated with Woodstock in Oxfordshire, where the magnificent Blenheim Palace stands today. Long before the classical architecture of Vanborough dominated the scene, Henry installed Rosamond in a lodge here. Legend has it that Eleanor discovered what's become known as Fair Rosamond's Boa, 
and the jealous queen is alleged to have poisoned her rival, who died in 1176. Although a good story, this is unlikely to be true, as Eleanor was spending more time away from Henry, attending to her lands in France, with the royal couple having in reality all but separated. As time passed, she took revenge on her philandering husband by turning his sons, especially her favourite Richard, against him, which eventually led to Henry's downfall and death at the age of 56. It's been reported that when Henry had no choice but to make peace with his son Richard, he secretly whispered, May the Lord never permit me to die until I have taken due vengeance upon you. The Queen of Aquitaine had over time proved to be more than a match for her unfaithful husband. And as she outlived both Henry II and their son Richard I, dying at the incredible age of 82, her influence as the Dowager Queen continued into the 13th century, making Eleanor a veritable tigress to her son's lion heart. Down through the ages, it's unusual to find a queen with the wealth, power, survival skills and sheer manipulative cunning of Eleanor of Aquitaine. And as we move on 300 years to the time of King Henry VIII, you can't help wondering if this much-married monarch had found himself with a wife of Eleanor's metal, history might not have had a very different outcome. When Richard III of the Royal House of York famously cried, A horse, a horse, a kingdom for a horse, in the version of events dramatised by the great bard of Avon, William Shakespeare, he was engaged in the fearsome battle of Bosworth Field. If popular legend is to be believed, in a fight to the death with Henry Tudor of the House of Lancaster, the crown, which Richard had worn into battle, fell from his head just before he was killed. Symbolically, the crown was retrieved from a bush and placed upon his victorious opponent's head, ending the War of the Roses, fought between the Yorkists and the Lancastrians for 30 years. To unite the two houses, the newly crowned King Henry VII went on to marry Elizabeth of York, and as the first Tudor king chose a rose emblem that combined the White Rose of Lancaster with the Red Rose of York. As a new royal dynasty, the line of succession was extremely important, but it proved advantageous that Henry VII had produced an heir and a spare, because his eldest son, Arthur, died, and the title of Prince of Wales passed to his second son, Henry, along with Arthur's widow, Catherine of Aragon. It was the old king's dying wish that Henry VIII should marry the Spanish-born Catherine of Aragon, and the wedding took place just a fortnight before his coronation at Westminster Abbey in 1509. Catherine was older than her bridegroom, and a special dispensation had to be given by the Pope in Rome for the marriage to take place, even though Catherine declared that due to their youth, the union with Arthur had never been consummated. 
At this time, Henry was nothing like the usual images we have of him in older age, being just 18, handsome, cultured and athletic. Queen Catherine without doubt adored him, and although aware that the king was often unfaithful to her, she remained constant to her husband her whole life long. It was an arrangement that would probably have suited both parties very well, had it not been for the fact that of the six children born to them, only one survived, with the added misfortune of being a girl. The Tudor dynasty required certainty, and the last time the crown had been destined for a female heir, Matilda, the result had been civil war when her cousin Stephen usurped her. As Catherine went beyond childbearing age, Henry turned to the Pope for an annulment, believing that the marriage was cursed because his queen had been his brother's widow. However, as the Vatican had allowed the union, by virtue of a special dispensation, to get around this in the first place, they were hardly going to agree with Henry, which would mean admitting that they'd got it wrong. Never a man to accept no for an answer, Henry broke away from Rome, made himself head of a new Protestant Church of England, and granted himself a divorce so that he could marry Anne Boleyn, who was already expecting his child. Although Catherine always refused to accept the divorce despite being separated from her daughter and forced to live without the comforts she was used to, in her heart she believed Henry would return to her. When Anne's child proved to be another girl, and efforts to produce a son were fruitless, the methods the desperate queen is alleged to have employed to achieve this resulted in her being sent to the Tower of London and executed for high treason in 1536, the year that the spurned Queen Catherine died. As we all know, Henry went on to marry again, and with his next wife, Jane Seymour, produced the son and heir the Tudor king had so longed for. It's possible love would have blossomed between them had she not died as a result of the birth, and the wives that followed failed to capture the aging Henry's heart. When Henry VIII died, his only son succeeded him, but the Tudor line was anything but secure. The scramble for power was far from dignified, and it was only when the crown finally reached Henry's daughter, Elizabeth, the child of Anne Boleyn, that the stability of the Tudor dynasty was assured. Elizabeth I ruled for an incredible 45 years and is a source of great fascination, not least because she chose never to marry. She was surrounded by suitors, yet steadfastly refused to make the ultimate commitment to any of them. At that time, if she'd married, all her wealth, power and position would have passed to her husband, and she learnt while she was still very young that she was being targeted by men who coveted her power. After Henry died, the then Princess Elizabeth became the ward of her father's surviving wife, Catherine Parr. Interestingly, when Henry had noticed Catherine more for her compassion to care for him as his health deteriorated than for her sexual prowess, she'd been in love with Thomas Seymour, the brother of Henry's third wife, Jane, but it would not have been wise for her to say no to the king. 
So, not surprisingly, within months of Henry's death, Catherine and Thomas married, giving Seymour intimate access to Elizabeth. And there's speculation that his attentions towards the young, impressionable girl were not altogether appropriate. When Catherine died in childbirth a year later, without doubt Thomas Seymour planned to marry the future Queen Elizabeth. But when this didn't work out, he changed tack and tried to kidnap Elizabeth's half-brother, the boy King Edward VI. Consequently, Seymour was caught and sent to the Tower of London on charges of high treason, where he was eventually executed, and legend has it that Elizabeth was heard to comment, Today died a man with much wit and not much judgment. Elizabeth had perhaps had a lucky escape and was evidently very cautious when she came to the throne. Some have suggested that as the love of her life, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, was already married, the new queen vowed she'd have no other husband. Also, her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, had been turned into nothing more than a pawn in an elaborate and deadly political game as a result of an unwise marriage to Lord Darnley. And when he was eventually murdered, rather than learning from her mistakes, she made another equally disastrous marriage. The consequence of this action was the imprisonment of the Scottish Queen by Elizabeth for almost 20 years, when she finally signed Mary's death warrant as her Catholic cousin had become too much of a threat, alleged to be at the heart of conspiracy after conspiracy. Whether Elizabeth was a virgin in the true sense of the word is impossible to say. Even so, that she loved passionately is beyond question. But like the Elizabeth that would follow her centuries later, this Tudor queen put service to her people and her country first, and England prospered. What happened after her passing, even she couldn't control. Although, ironically, Elizabeth named her cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, only son, heir to her throne. As any good history book will tell you, the Tudors were followed by the Stuarts, and although James I, son of Mary, Queen of Scots, united England and Scotland, both he and Charles I, the son who followed him, were clever men who proved to be disastrous kings. Charles I was a great believer in the divine right of kings and refused to listen to Parliament until, of course, it was too late. Led by Oliver Cromwell, the parliamentarians launched a civil war against the king and his royalist supporters, which resulted in the execution of Charles I, leaving the nation subject to the puritanical protection of Oliver Cromwell, who even outlawed Christmas. Needless to say, when the Commonwealth under Cromwell's control came to an end in 1660, the people of Britain were ready for some decadence and fun. When Charles II returned from exile in France to be restored to the throne, the Merry Monarch, as the handsome Charles was known, led by example. He's most famous for having a succession of high-profile mistresses, but his favourite was, without doubt, the actress Nell Gwynne. Gwyn. 
Instead of turning the people of Britain against him, Charles's popularity rose to new heights for loving a commoner. It's alleged that on his deathbed, the king's last words were, let not poor Nelly starve. And Charles's successor, his brother, James II, paid off Nell's mortgage, all her debts, and granted her a substantial pension, which does add credence to the tale. Despite Charles II producing a plethora of illegitimate offspring, he lacked an heir apparent, which is why his brother succeeded him. However, this did weaken the House of Stuart considerably, and after the demise of Charles II's nieces, the people of Britain were told Queen Anne's dead, and with her, so was the Stuart hold on the throne. And at last, we come to a genuine royal love story between a king and a queen who met each other for the first time at St. James's Palace six hours before they were married in 1761. The bridegroom was King George III of the Royal House of Hanover and his bride was Princess Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz it seems the couple had similar tastes, sharing a love of the countryside, and the king, often known as Farmer George, was fascinated by anything to do with agriculture. The happy pair produced a huge family, consisting of 15 children, and despite almost every king to have gone before him keeping a fine collection of mistresses, this deeply religious George remained faithful to Queen Charlotte throughout their marriage. But if you're expecting a happy ending, you're going to be sadly disappointed. In 1788, the king's behaviour became very strange and many believed him to be mad. A later episode found him addressing a mighty oak tree as the King of Prussia, and eventually his eldest son, the future George IV, took over as Prince Regent in 1811. What it now appears he was suffering from was the physical illness Porphyria, which manifested itself as madness, and as her husband faded before her eyes, the once gracious Queen Charlotte became increasingly depressed and actually died two years before George III did. Now, although when it came to womanising as Prince Regent and King, George IV was notorious, whether or not he ever actually found love is difficult to say. Ironically, his younger brother William, who succeeded him because George IV had produced no legitimate heir, fared rather better in love, albeit his liaisons were equally as scandalous. William IV was king for just six days short of seven years, and already 61 when he came to the throne. A naval man known for his colourful language and a forthright lack of tact, despite the nickname Silly Billy, endeared himself to the great British people, being far more down to earth than his older brother. when it came to the ladies, like Charles II, William had a very public affair with an actress, which lasted for 22 years, and as depicted in this cartoon by the political satirist of the day, James Gilray, resulted in 10 illegitimate children. But there is another love story which involves William, while still Duke of Clarence that is far less well known and we've travelled to the beautiful county of Gloucestershire once again to visit the magnificent Berkeley Castle. No stranger to royal scandal, this is where the unfortunate King Edward II was murdered way back in the 14th century, 
and throughout history, this has been one ancestral seat with more than its fair share of colourful characters. And it was a very interesting Countess of Berkeley who's thought to have attracted the Duke of Clarence's attention back in the early 1800s. Mary Cole was a butcher's daughter from Gloucester who rose considerably above her station in life to marry Frederick Augustus, the 5th Earl of Berkeley, in 1796. However, a number of their children were born well before this date, but it was claimed that an earlier wedding had taken place, generating considerable legal wrangling over the validity, and there were even suggestions that the parish records in Berkeley's Church of St Mary were tampered with. When the Earl died in 1810, while questions over which children were legitimate were being asked, Mary was evidently a very attractive widow. This was at the time when the Prince of Wales became Prince Regent, and a few years later, the future George IV's only legitimate heir, Princess Charlotte, died in childbirth. It also coincided with a period of financial trouble for William, and with no heir apparent, the race was on amongst all the sons of George III to come up with a healthy, legitimate offspring to carry on the line of succession. William left the actress Dorothea Jordan, with whom he'd had ten children, and started the search for a wealthy, suitable wife. The Countess of Berkeley had produced 12 children, so was obviously fertile, and it's highly likely that the lovely Mary was as down to earth as the Duke of Clarence was, and it's probable they would have done very well together. But here's the irony. Although William had enjoyed a blissful existence with his actress mistress, not to mention the bedroom antics of his brother, the Prince Regent, it was felt the Countess of Berkeley would bring the monarchy into disrepute because of the legitimacy issues connected with her children. So the future King William IV married a suitable princess, Adelaide of saxe menignon but the two daughters the union produced died in infancy and the throne passed to William's 18-year-old niece, Victoria, daughter of his younger brother, the Duke of Kent, when he died in 1837. Although the most commonly perceived image we have of Queen Victoria is that of a stern elderly lady dressed from head to toe in black, when she came to the throne she was a lovely young girl and immediately thoughts turned to finding a suitable bridegroom. The preference for Victoria's first cousin, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, was confirmed when the couple met for a second time in 1839, having first encountered each other three years earlier. Evidently, the new queen approved of Albert, describing him as so sensible, so kind, so good and so amiable, with the added bonus of the most pleasing and delightful exterior and appearance you could possibly see. In fact, the couple were married at St James's Palace on the 10th of February 1840, after Victoria had proposed to Albert as protocol demanded of a reigning monarch. Despite its undoubted convenience, this was a royal marriage based on love, making it, as this programme has demonstrated, something of a rarity. Nine children were born to the happy couple between 1840 and 1857, as family values were restored to the nation after the long run of wild living princes and kings. Today, many of us associate this period of history with Christmas, and we owe some of our best-loved seasonal traditions to the gifts bestowed by the German-born Prince Albert upon his wife and family. The most famous of these has to be the Christmas tree, which Albert arranged as a special surprise. For centuries, the Germans had decorated trees in a midwinter festival, covering the bare branches of mighty oaks with brightly coloured rags to encourage the tree spirits to return and make the leaves grow again. 
Eventually, with the arrival of Christianity, this practice was moved to Christmas, with a fir tree substituted for the oak, thanks to its triangular shape representing the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Further adornments were added when the priest Martin Luther used candles on a fir tree for a special Christmas Eve service, and when Prince Albert presented his family with a beautifully decorated tree, it was an act of love and very romantic indeed. When news of the royal Christmas tree reached the people of Britain, the next year everybody wanted one. And since Victoria's reign, no traditional Christmas would be considered complete without a festively decorated tree. Where the royal family led, the rest of the nation was bound to follow, and another of Prince Albert's loving gifts to Queen Victoria further encouraged a great British summer tradition. The concept of a seaside holiday had been popular since Georgian times, and Prince Albert was instrumental in creating the magnificent Osborne House on the Isle of Wight as a royal seaside retreat for his hard-working wife. The Isle of Wight became a popular destination for holidaymakers, but the royal retreat remained extremely private. And even today, you can still find evidence of how Victoria and Albert, accompanied by their children, enjoyed the pleasures of the Isle of Wight. The nearest village to Osborne is Whippingham, and the magnificent church of St Mildred was where the royal family worshipped when they were in residence. Also, the row of arms houses opposite the church were built on Queen Victoria's instructions for the retired royal servants from the Osborne estate, making this a surprising find along an incredibly quiet single track country lane. For Victorian visitors to the Isle of Wight, the advent of steam and the creation of the railway provided a most popular means of transport and Queen Victoria herself travelled by train around the island. Part of the railway system has been restored by the Isle of Wight Steam Railway Society, and with their prized collection of Victorian railway carriages, their headquarters at Haven Street is a delightful destination. However, you won't find any steam engines stopping at Whippingham, despite the fact that the station building still stands. This was actually Queen Victoria and the royal family's own private station in the 19th century, and a short walk along the peaceful footpath will uncover traces of the old platform where once upon a time, not all that long ago, a happily married royal couple alighted from a stylish carriage to hide from the world and enjoy a seaside holiday with their children. With the strict demands of protocol, it must have been a strain at times for Prince Albert to be head of the household when his wife was the Queen. Yet there are plenty of memorials to Prince Albert in his own right, with the most grand built upon the orders of Victoria. If proof were needed that the Queen adored her husband, when this promising royal love story came to a tragically abrupt end with Albert's death in 1861 at the age of 42, Victoria wore funeral black for the rest of her life.
For 13 years, Victoria went into deep mourning and refused to appear in public, retreating to Osborne and the other home Prince Albert had rebuilt for her at Balmoral in Scotland whenever she could. In fact, so complete was Victoria's withdrawal from her people that there was even talk of the abolition of the monarchy. But there was one man who is thought to have been instrumental in restoring Queen Victoria to her waiting public, a Scottish servant by the name of John Brown. Much has been written on the subject and it's alleged that there was even a secret marriage between this mismatched couple, with satirists of the day referring to the Queen as Mrs Brown. Whatever the true facts, Queen Victoria had a passionate love affair with Scotland, and even the Prime Ministers that served her were forced to travel north of the border on occasion to seek an audience with Her Majesty. Without doubt, her favourite was Benjamin Disraeli, who she much preferred to his main rival, William Gladstone, who she loathed. Although there's no suggestion of impropriety here, it does go to illustrate how Queen Victoria developed strong attachments to certain people, relying on them both personally and professionally. Nevertheless, it was a lock of John Brown's hair that she allegedly requested her doctor place in her coffin, and when she died in 1901, the secret of whatever happened between the Queen and John Brown was buried with her. Queen Victoria's fondness for her favourites and lack of amusement with those who displeased her is legendary, and even her own children were not exempt from her wrath. The Prince of Wales, her eldest son Bertie, was constantly out of favour with his mother, in part because she blamed him for the early death of his father, her beloved Prince Albert. And when it came to the Prince of Wales's feelings for his mother, a lifetime facing her disapproval perhaps fuelled his wild behaviour rather than curbed it. In fact, when she died, one of the first things the 59-year-old did was give Osborne House to the nation, supposedly as a memorial to his mother. However, it's been suggested that the new King Edward VII was thrilled to get rid of the house where he'd been so dominated. King Edward VII is perhaps best known for keeping a succession of glamorous mistresses, and whether or not he was truly in love with any woman is very hard to judge. No doubt the most eminent psychiatrist of the day, Sigmund Freud, would have had much to say on the subject, but although the king may have struggled with love, he certainly inspired others, namely his people, his mistresses and most of all his wife, Queen Alexandra. Whatever her husband's well-publicised misdemeanours, the elegant and dignified Danish princess he'd had the good sense to marry stood resolutely at his side, taking consolation in the fact that she believed the king always loved her best. Moving into the early 20th century, one of the most famous royal romances of all times resulted in a marriage, but also threatened the monarchy and brought about the abdication of King Edward VIII in 1936. The object of Edward's affections was an American divorcee, Wallace Simpson, who he was determined to marry as soon as she was free. Britain as a nation was shocked and felt that the American socialite had stolen their king. Some suggest that Edward had found a convenient way of shirking his royal duties, while others are of the opinion that this was indeed true love, and the king had been braver than those of his predecessors who'd settled for a marriage of convenience and a string of mistresses. 
As Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Edward and Wallace lived in exile in Paris and were only parted when the Duke died from throat cancer in 1972. As our time looking at royal romances draws to a close, we couldn't possibly conclude without considering the most widely publicised royal romance of all time between Charles, His Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, and Lady Diana Spencer. Ironically, had Edward VIII ruled as king, married a suitable lady and produced an heir, Prince Charles may never have found himself first in line to the British throne. When he was just three years old, his mother became Queen Elizabeth II, and by the time the prince had come of age, every press agency in the world was speculating about who the eligible young royal would marry. Prince Charles certainly seemed to be in no hurry to find a bride, but shortly after his 30th birthday, he met the shy youngest daughter of Earl Spencer of Althorpe, Lady Diana. With an impeccable ancestry, Diana had been born on the royal estate at Sandringham before moving to Althorpe in Northamptonshire when her father inherited the title Earl Spencer. After a brief spell at finishing school, Diana bought herself a flat in fashionable Fulham and flourished as a children's nanny, a job that she loved. Before long, it wasn't only Prince Charles who'd been captivated by Diana. The British public started a love affair with the future Princess of Wales that would last for all time. It was a 20th century fairy story come true, and when Diana left Buckingham Palace, a lady to marry her Prince Charming under the huge dome of St Paul's Cathedral on the 29th of July 1981, she returned a princess to the delight of the cheering crowds. London was in a mood to celebrate the royal wedding that heralded a new age in the history of the British monarchy. In a few short years, the new Princess of Wales blossomed into a delightful young woman with a unique style of her own. And after the birth of two sons, Prince William and Harry had secured the succession and fulfilled one of her most important royal duties as a future queen. But things were not all that they might have seemed, and eventually both Buckingham Palace and the British government had to admit that the romance was over and the Prince and Princess of Wales were divorced in 1996. And as we all know, this was not the end of the story. Even stripped of her HRH status, Diana, Princess of Wales, was still adored wherever she went, and for just the briefest of moments, it appeared that she was succeeding in building a new life for herself. Then tragedy struck on a Paris night in August 1997, when Diana was killed in a car crash along with her companion, Dodi al Fayad, and their driver. The outpouring of public grief and the dignified funeral of the young woman who'd changed the face of British royalty proved beyond question just how adored Diana had been. And when she was finally laid to rest on a peaceful island in the middle of the Oval Lake at Althorpe, her ancestral home, the nation vowed never to forget Diana, Princess of Wales. It's a promise that's been kept, and as the years go by, visitors to Althorpe in Northamptonshire and the London residences that Diana called home, from the charming flat in Colhoun Court to the regal elegance of Kensington Palace, we are constantly reminded that Diana the people's princess once passed this way. The fairy tale may not have ended as everyone, not least Charles and Diana, had hoped, but this story nonetheless qualifies as a royal romance of its time. Throughout history, 
there have been many more royal romances than those featured in this program. And in truth, so long as the monarchy survives, there will be many more to come. Ironically, it isn't only the members of the royal families of the past for whom true love ran smoothly who are most fondly remembered. Because, just as is the case in popular novels, when it comes to romance, whether royal or otherwise, there's always room for secrets and intrigue alongside the hearts and flowers.